from now, we'll look back on the death penalty the way people look back on medieval executions, and medieval tortures, and hanging people with weights and, and things like that. Terry William. It's not me personally, but it's 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 me and uh, a, a team, right? So one of the things I want to sort of convey to you is that um, you know the the relationship to the case uh, comes to us through a need that Mr. Williams had to raise in this most recent round. A we've been representing Terry for a very long time. We represented him through a first round of post-conviction following his uh, direct appeal after his conviction and, and sentenced to death. We represented him in a, in, in a round of habeas. And in 2012, he, he became the subject of, of a warrant uh, from Governor Corbett. And in 2012, that looked like uh, you know, a situation that was, could get to a point where we hadn't been yet in Pennsylvania in a very long time. So in 2012, we got busy uh, doing what we do, which is to reinvestigate the case. What might have been missed? Where may have there have been a gap in the investigation? Was there a change in anybody else's circumstance around the case that would allow us to generate, gather, develop even more evidence, right, to make the case that, that, that our client really needed to be made, that he was not the worst of the worst, not deserving of the death penalty, and maybe that there was something else that happened in the case which really affected whether he was a first degree killer or not, right? So our relationship to the case was as his, his lawyers in post-conviction. And we remained his lawyers through that moment in 2012 uh, when under warrant we raised some of the, 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 an issue that came about because of our reinvestigation when material was discovered in the boxes of the prosecutors by the judge and by, by us, uh, following her demand that those boxes be made available. We litigated that. We, 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 the judge decided that there had been a violation of Mr. Williams' rights and granted relief in 2012 at that state court level. We appealed that, our yeah. office did, that's our relationship to the case, to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and that's where we encountered, that, that, the issue arose where uh, that just that uh, Professor Natalie just described her in the U.S. Supreme Court. But our role, again, in that case was as his appellate lawyers in post-conviction. And, and after that was concluded... We should probably say Chief Justice Castile had been the prosecutor in, in the case, and he personally, one of the things found in the boxes was his hand-approved uh, response to chief of homicide's request to have the death penalty in Terry's case. Right, so there was a very visceral, physical piece of evidence that showed his participation in this particular case. And then, uh, uh, as a big an issue, there were other things in the file that suggested that the trial prosecutor knew a lot more about the, uh, the, the, the actual accuracy of the relationship between the decedent and, and Terry, and uh, that had been suppressed at the time of trial. Um, so, in reviewing that decision, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, with Justice Castile sitting, um, uh, reversed that decision of the trial court and decided that because Terry had known this information that had been kind of revealed through other witnesses um, that had been suppressed by the Commonwealth, that it was really Terry's fault that the information and the evidence hadn't been properly managed. So they reversed it and didn't even send it back. It was just, and we reinstate the death penalty. So we, in our, my relationship with the case is still representing Terry Williams, who remains convicted of first degree murder with a death sentence intact. And then we, we appealed, we, we, we asked the US Supreme Court to review that moment when Justice Castile, when asked to remove himself from consideration of the appeal, declined to do that. That's pending before the U.S. Supreme Court, but every day we still represent Mr. Williams. And uh, that's our relationship to the case. We represent him. So uh, my role in this case uh, was a, a little bit more um, of, uh, I was able to say things that, that, that Christie's 
office um, was not able to say. And I was able to write things that, that their office was un unable to write. So I, was a little, I did a little more of a communications aspect of the case. And, and there, there's some pretty shocking communications uh, issues in, in the case. I just I want to highlight a couple of things. First of all, Christy, you know, whether immodestly or not, or immodestly or not, she happens to work in the best office in the country for this work. Federal habeas office of the of the Defender Association is the best office in the country. Um, and I, I say that going to a lot of these offices. Their office by far is the best and has the best track record. Having said that, there was something really heroic that happened. Um, aside from their office's litigation, which was the Judge Sarmina was the judge uh, in 2012 who granted access to these files. That was a very, very brave and correct thing for her to do. Um, this is particularly painful for me because just yesterday I was litigating in front of a judge in a horrible death penalty case with real injustice and a district attorney who claimed to have misread the DNA report, putting the guy wrongfully on death row for nine years. And yet the judge I was in front of did not grant access to those, to those files. You'd think that that was the best case possible. So my point here is not to get pity from you, but to point out how brave Judge Sarmina was in doing what she did. Uh, something that a lot of, that some of you are going to work for judges, no doubt. And, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully things will get better in the future. Anyway, Judge, Judge Sarmina did this brave thing. The federal defenders found some, some incredible uh, uh, material showing, you know, what I think, what I think can persuasively be claimed as, as prosecutorial misconduct pretty overtly. Uh, uh, Christie said that, that uh, Christie said that, that the, the court had blamed, had, had, had said there was no error because Tyree Williams knew about these things. And um, what the court did not mention, um, but what we have you know, learned through, through the federal defenders investigation and so forth, is that Tyree Williams, who was barely 18 at the time of this crime, had only met his lawyer the day before the case began. So the Supreme Court, you know, here's this, and of course I'm talking about my communications role. This was a big part of my, my communications, which was, here's the Supreme Court expecting this barely 18-year-old kid to open up to a lawyer he had really not even met about all sorts of very, very private uh, abusive uh, uh, issues. So I think we can fairly say that, that uh, that's not something we should expect from, it, from an 18-year-old kid. So there were quite a lot of interesting things in the Terry Williams case. Altogether, I think it really shows the, the, the problems with the death penalty. Uh, a, a lawyer who barely met him, a prosecutor who was playing very fast and loose with the, with the police reports, uh, and a prosecutor who I think is acting a little bit like, like uh, the prosecutor in, in, in Lay Mids. So anyway, I started on the, on the, um, uh, on the on January 21st, uh, Governor Corbett in the last days, I think January 13th, the last days of his administration signed an execution warrant for, uh, for Terry Williams, Governor Wolf, who I had not met until a few weeks before, um, uh, before he became governor, uh, had already decided what his plans were with respect to the death penalty, and he issued a reprieve. I think it was on February 13th. Uh, at the same time, I'll send him your applause. Uh, and at the same time, he, he, he issued a press release in, uh, uh, that, in which he said that he intended, he, he, he did so because of serious concerns about the, uh, about the justice of death penalty in Pennsylvania, uh, it happened that back in 2011, the Senate, Senate Resolution 6 of 2011, had established a task force, which we'll be talking about a little later. Um, to study that that penalty in Pennsylvania, he said, I don't, you know, I'm not going to uh, proceed with the execution of anybody in this state uh, until we have a report from the task force and any concerns that are raised by that report um, are, are satisfactorily addressed. So that was on the 13th. Um, on the 18th, just five days later, Seth Williams, uh, filed a King's Bench petition in the Supreme Court challenging, um, seeking, an, seeking emergency relief from the Supreme Court, um, challenging the governor's authority to issue the reprieve. Uh, again, there was an execution date of March 4th. It was cast as an emergency petition. We need to get rid of this reprieve so we can execute Terry Williams uh, on the 4th. We 
we've given, I think, uh, four, roughly 48 hours to respond to that. So it was, a, it was a, my first brief. Uh, <laughs> uh, Representing the governor, we had almost no time. It was no brief, it was an answer. Uh, so we answered it. Successfully persuaded the court um, that uh, there wasn't an emergency that required swift action, and the court set up for ordinary briefing and argument. So we briefed it over the summer. Um, That's a huge win, by the way. <laughs> Is our is is our lifeblood as 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 we people generally in the work so. I'm finding so many different mentalities today. It seems hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge. And I was and I was built for this. I think that we all have a purpose in life. And mine.